Hello and good evening from where I am. It's it's about to get dark actually where I am. So um, it's lovely to be back on the podcast for the personalization experience. Let's call this season two um, of the personalization experience. Um, obviously, we were at the event in Munich in May. Uh, and my guest tonight actually was one of our speakers there. Um, and I'm keen to hear from him really, not only what his thoughts of the first inaugural event were of, um, of the personalization experience, but actually what maybe we can expect from the world of personalization to come. So my guest tonight is a professor of innovation management and a scholar of mass customization, open innovation and digital disruption. Disruption. Good evening, Frank Piller. Hi, Rich. Yeah, my pleasure being with you. And actually, I use the term mass customization where you will use personalization. And that was the topic of my PhD in 1995. So really long, long time ago. So I was on a lot of events in you know this domain over the years many from oil engineering some of marketing and i was very pleased to meet a new community this year in may on the personalization summit and i really liked it for let's say two or three things first there was a lot of really people that do it you know not just people talking about it but a lot of users of personalization with regard to improving the business model Secondly, there was really cool tech, as I really liked that this um, event was part of the trade show. We really could see the technology that enables it. But thirdly, there was a little bit a new perspective. My perspective was very much on customization and the past, you know, flexible manufacturing system, product architecture, on discrete production. But I think the um, event showed us that personalization is a much larger field today, you know, than a configure to order car. This really, it's and also the focus on why are you doing it? You know, what's really the idea of the, the next level of consumer trends? I was very fascinated by this talk um, of an expert talking of the generation A, what's coming after the generation that, and how this new you know, breed of people that are not consumers yet, but really will influence um, how we think about personalization. So overall, congratulations in the backside to really cool first edition. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, you know, I, I think it was a success, um, uh, not not in any small part to, to your contribution. So thank you very much for being a speaker with us uh, in, in season one. Uh, season two is, is uh, being launched shortly um, for the event in March 2024, this time in Amsterdam. And I guess what we're looking forward to, Frank, from the next um, event is is really a, a deeper dive into into not just what personalization is, but what it means, what it's for. Your lights are gone. You warn me about that. This is this is the, the Halloween effect, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. Exactly. Frank, you organize this so that the lights keep well, going. Well, the room is not personalized to my behavior. So probably <laughs> have to move where it's all about energy consumption. Here I see, the I see, I see what you did. Um, so yeah, so you know, the, the the idea really of these podcasts in this next season uh, is to 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 take that understanding of what personalization is and take it forward and 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 sort of almost discuss and theorize what it's for it's been around a while now frank as we as we all know um it gets used in many different ways and for many different products and it's called many different things and as we discovered from the conference last time it means different things to different people so i guess uh, to start with it would be really interesting to hear from you as a consumer uh what what personalization means to you well, from a consumer perspective, I actually don't care how it is done, but just that I got what I want, when I want it, how I want it. You know, and um, I don't want to compromise. I don't want to compromise with different variants where I have to have a trade-off. So in the end, personalization is really achieving my objectives. And that don't, doesn't mean to be that it is really a product. A lot of personalization could be actually in services or the combination of a product with a service as in the end, that's probably not as I would say it as a consumer, but now the professor is talking, I want a job to be done in what I want. I want to achieve something. And this I want to do as efficient, but perhaps also as pleasant as possible. That's exactly where personalization helps. As in the end, now from the company perspective, 
We always think that the fact that consumers are different is a threat, is a factor of complexity, something we have to manage. But as I like to say, it's actually a huge profit opportunity. You know, and the profit comes from the fact that we really care about the individual characteristics of consumers individually. So uh, would you say then to, to characterize that, that, that and, and I'm a little bit the same with cars, by the way, I, I don't care how they work, I just care that they work. Um, and, and would you say that the, the sort of the progress that we've seen over the last 10 years with the ability of, of companies and brands and print businesses to, to be able to deploy personalization is less important to the consumer as to, as to how they're doing it, but incredibly important as to why they're doing it? Yes, absolutely. Well, there are different facets. So there are different dimensions of the value of personalization to a consumer. And of course, there's a kind of hedonistic value where really it's important that I know it's personalized for me, for me that I want perhaps to show off to my friends and say this was just made for me. And this is just really one facet. It's a little bit of a novelty effect. I'm not doing this too often, you know. In the end, I don't care about personalization. Personalization is not a, sol a, a, a value per se. It's a solution. You know, and as you said, probably the print industry, the, the, the digital printing is a big enabler, but as a consumer, I don't care. But if I can transform a boring bar of chocolate into a present as it has a customer weapon that so really shows to the person that I cared about her when I gift it. Yeah, that's about uh, the effect here. So and then, of course, I could do it by myself. I could just, you know, take paper, cord, and burning. But if I have a service provider that helps me to do this on a very professional way, then my secondary value is that I can surprise someone individually and internally have less effort. So this is where the value gets transferred, isn't it? From So personalization, as you're describing it, is a service. Um, but actually, um, the, the value is in the, is in the demonstration, if, we, if, if you like, that, that one person has taken slightly more time over thinking about your gift, thinking about your product, thinking about their communication. Because, you know, this isn't, it isn't unique to gifting, of course. You know, the, the deployment of personalization across the whole business spectrum has now become commonplace but what but what you're saying is it, it's it's nobody's interested as to how they do it but that but they're really impressed still to this day um you know that it that it can be done yeah but you could also say the best personality the ultimate personalization solution is one that i actually don't realize that it's personalized you know where i get a continual stream of things that we really like, and some of the digital media platforms are actually quite good in this. You know, if you have an algorithm that's fine-tuning the news you see to really slowly to your behavior, in a way that there still is a factor of surprise, you know, that not everything is predicted. So there's an art in how much personalization actually is good in. I think that's somehow the ultimate goal. And probably we are still doing this podcast as we don't have our butlers living in a big castle where someone is really knowing exactly what we want, you know, and fulfilling this dream. And for, so for me, personalization is also kind of democratizing, you know, that way the lifestyle of the very rich, they have personal assistants that really care about all that for the masses. Speak for yourself, Frank. My butler's taken the day off, um, you know, so I've had to I've had to look after the castle myself today, but there we are. Um, yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. And I guess where, where this all sort of came from really in the print industry was the ability to with digital print to use variable data and and to really start thinking about doing a million ones um rather than a million of everything um and that's that's really in my mind in many ways stalled um in the in the labeling sector um in the gifting arena it hasn't really sort of fallen out into the into the wider world of commerce but what you're saying is that that companies now are doing this a little bit more subtly there may be they may be sort of personalizing their approach to you rather than just simply putting your name on something. Or take another example from your industry and on your conference, I uh, met the CTO of one of the pioneers of on-demand book printing. 
So the book actually you get is a standard product. Now it's not customized for me, but in the business to business process with regard to supply chain efficiency, of course, there's a big, big value now, not for the end consumer who gets a standard book, but for the book retailer, for the wholesaler to not have a huge you know, pile of books on stock, but to have a very advanced digital printing capability plus a the website and the server infrastructure and so to book a print on demand where actually my myself as a reader don't recognize this hardcover book was just produced for me or not in a traditional high-end printing regime, you know, in, in thousands of items. So also that is a kind of personalization that creates a lot of value, now not to the end consumer, but for the um, supply chain and the retailer who don't have this inventory. So it's streamlined business costs in in many ways. It's it's added value, or at the very least, the perception of value to the the approach uh, to consumers. So so personalization is being used, but not necessarily overtly. In in that the customer almost feels um, as though they're being spoken to as an individual, um, but actually in reality, it's probably algorithm uh, algorithms that's doing that for them. Absolutely. And there are these old cases and really digital printing came up that American supermarkets started to print individual advertising brochures, you know, that were delivered to each individual household fed by your scanning data from your loyalty card, you know, that they know, they know loud your profile. And you really, they produced millions of lot size of one of um, brochures. But of course, then it's not just the printing ability, but it's really the, what we now then would call AI, you know, the, the data analytics ab ability, the way how to create content for that, you know, so the personalization here was on the one hand side that I only see advertisement I really care about. So I'm out of the age of diaper and not old enough to come back to diapers, you know, but in the moment I don't want to see it yet, um, but perhaps some nice drinks, you know, for the weekend I would care for more. And of course, for a supermarket that just has these 10 pages of brochure, they want to personalize it in a way to improve the efficiency of the advertising spend. So also that is a kind of dual-sided personalization. For me, I only see the adverts I like and the um, supermarket is spending their money more wisely, given that they have the intelligence behind. I think this was one of the the outcomes from the personalization experience last time round, was that, that the agreement was that there was no one way that you could describe personalization. Yeah. <laughs> And that it means, you know, means very different things to very different people, lots of different expressions for it, be that bespoke, be that customized, be that tailor made. Um, you know, ultimately, what one of the things that we're seeing is that there's no cohesive one thing that you can that you can describe, um, you use personalization to describe. So looking forward, Frank, to to the next event. And I know, unfortunately, you can't join us because you're elsewhere uh, in March, but looking forward to to version two, uh, edition two, what would you like to see? In terms of the conversation, how would you like to see the conversation moved on? So if that was, we're all agreed that it's lots of things, what, what's the next stage of this conversation, do you think? Well, on the one hand side, I really would like to see unconventional use cases, perhaps case studies we didn't heard about yet, you know, to really show the scope where this happened. I also really would like to hear something about the true value, you know, what it really means on it, how you quantify the value, what would be metrics for uh, KPIs, you know, to measure that value. I think that is once you are in an established company and you are, the, um, you know, the business developer that um, pitches this to the boss, that's exactly what she is asking. What are the specific measurements for the performance? I think that could be an interesting debate. And of course, I also personally would love to see some new tech, you know, of really a nice new technology that really provides a different, uh, you know, approach to making personalization either more fun or more efficient. And we've got an incredible lineup of speakers, uh, Frank, um, already booked for March, um, predominantly from the major brands, actually. And, and I think that's that's quite a shift forward because for many years, and I know from my own work in, in that field, brands have always been largely suspicious of something that they don't understand. Um, and, and certainly last time around, they came to Munich 
discovered an awful lot of tech that they didn't know existed have, have, have started to look at the world that they can that they can use this for and of course you know the likes of adidas and nike um and diageo and the nfl um are all going to be speaking at the next edition of the personalization experience and and what they've discovered is today's consumer likes almost to co-brand so they 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 want their adidas trainers but they want their own name on them. And that sort of duality is something that we're seeing a lot. Do, do you find that as well in, in uh, certainly in Germany as a market? I'm guessing that's quite a big, a big trend. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is somehow, as you said, often originally we thought big brands should be against it. But as you say, it's really now a kind of more interaction. We are not consuming a brand. We want to co-create a brand. And I think this is actually an easy way. I always would say, brands are a little bit more ambitious than just allowing consumers to put their initials or name on it. But it could be a first step. But I think it's it's probably more uh, that can be achieved if you go beyond what's possible today. And I think also, um, now I really am more sad to miss this event, is actually one of the biggest challenges for established companies, and I'm sure your speakers will also share that, is not just how to do it and what's the value, but how to really change the thinking in an established business. So really how you convince your colleagues that this is possible, you know, as you adopt your, your business model behind. So I'm sure you also will have this kind of debate as next to the technology and the right value proposition is actually also one of the core success factors. Absolutely. And and if I could ask you to finish, Frank, one thing that you'd like to see come from the next edition of this conference, because as you know, we're trying to really expand the conversation out into the wider world as to what personalization is for. What would be a, a holy grail for you in terms of, of an outcome? So super cool would be is there really could evolve a kind of new community of practice that the conference actually does not stop when the conference is over, but the conference was just the beginning. You know, that perhaps there's a LinkedIn group or whatever platform you would like to use, but to really keep on the discussion, um, you know, until um, then 2025 was a third edition. Well, I hope you'll be available for the 2025 edition and and come back and join us and and, and almost look back, uh, you know, on on the journey that we've made over the last couple of years. It was an absolute pleasure um, hosting you on the stage in May, and I would very much like to do the same again. But for now, Frank, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This has been the Personalization Experience Podcast with myself, Richard Askham, and my guest tonight, Frank Piller. Thank <laughs> you.